guys, uh, I'll tell you what, this morning we've been uh, inundated with a lot. If you're on social media, uh, you've been receiving um, um, some updates of what's happening at Asbury University, one of, uh, one of major Christian colleges, universities in our country. And, uh, you know, three years ago, three years ago, God gave a prophetic word to this church. There's no question in my spirit that God was going to raise up young people at Carroll Assembly of God. And it was not just me receiving, it was another minister who came and shared it with me. He said, I had to come to Carroll, give you lunch, so I could share what God has stirred in my heart for your church. He and I weren't that very close, but uh, he certainly knew he needed to come and see me. And I believe, church, do you believe with me? See what God is doing. God is raising up our younger generation. And uh, so I'm thankful. It happens, it can happen in every church and should happen in every church. Amen? A sign of a healthy church is a generation of young people who are taking the charge and saying, I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm going to, as the song said this morning, draw close to him. And would you agree with me this morning? That's exactly what we're hearing and seeing happen. People are being drawn to Jesus. Today, I want to talk to you about encountering the righteousness of Christ. Because in all of this, as I've been praying this week for this service, and believe me, I've been praying for this service all week long, and asking God, what would he have for me to share with us this morning? That I believe that what we are witnessing today, not just in young people, because guess what? As Josh so eloquently said, us older group, the old guys, all right? We can learn and, and gain encouragement. And as he said in the video this morning, we should be praying for them. So guess what I'm going to be doing, especially on Thursday, throughout the day. Those of you that come and join us at Thursday Bible study, guess what we're going to do Thursday together? We're going to pray for our younger generation. Lord, let it start in our own church. Let it start among us. Let it start in every church of our community. As I have been witnessed to many of my Minister friends that I have fellowship in our district. Um, they're all kind of in the same place I am this morning. Lord, just move. I received a personal text from our district superintendent this morning. He said, I'm praying especially for Carol Assembly of God and for your church this morning. And I'm telling you what, I got a text from my pastor. I thought, man, that's awesome. Of all the churches, and he, she says, I'm just kind of going through the area of the thumb this morning, and he says, I want you to know that I'm praying for you right now for your service, and I'm praying for your people. That has a lot to say with what God wants to do, amen? So I came walking through these doors saying, God, I got a word I want to share, and I don't know how I'm going to do it, but the Holy Spirit's going to help me share it. And I want you to leave here today with something that's stirring in your spirit that won't just stay in your spirit till midnight tonight and Monday, everything's back to the way it used to be. Because when God gets a hold of your heart and life, things can't be the way they used to be. And the church as a whole, getting used to the way things just are. You saw from the video clip, 50 years ago, a great move of God among a generation. And I believe this morning that God wants to move in another time, in this time, in another generation. Can you say amen? I believe it. I tell our young people, man, you guys got life group tonight? I'd like to be a part of your life group. Uh, not just because I want to be younger, Josh. But young people, come to life group tonight. Take, what was, take what's going to be shared this morning and then meditate on it. Tell your friends, come, how many of you know that we could have revival break out on a Sunday night at 5 o'clock in the basement of our church, right? Can we? Could it happen? Absolutely. We like to eat. I'd like to have Bible study. But the work is praying. Praying one for another. And so this morning, what does Matthew 5, 6 say? Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. That's a promise. It's a conditional promise because you have to hunger and thirst for it. There is the, that part of our life that can be measured. Just 
You can take your life and you can measure your life in light of the Holy Spirit of God. Have there been times in your life you feel like, man, I've been kind of slipping. I've kind of been careless. Do you know what I'm talking about? You can measure that to some degree and you need a wake-up call, if you will, to say, wait a minute, what are you doing? Why aren't you doing this? Why aren't you reading your Bible? Why aren't you praying? Why aren't you being in church? You're letting things slip and slide in your life so you can measure where you're at spiritually to some degree with the help of the Holy Spirit. Are you truly hungering and thirsting after righteousness? Jesus said, what shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? What are we pursuing? You've seen these videos, these stories of the last week or so at Asbury. But it's happening all over the place, not just there. But we have a fascination with a lot of things, don't we? Man, I've noticed people fascinated with flying objects lately. Have you? Come on. Flying objects. We've been heartbroken with the news of a devastating earthquake in Turkey. We all want to see the uncovering of all the wrongdoing of people. So we earnestly watch to see what's going to happen with so-and-so. Oh, and who could forget last week? The Super Bowl! And people were fascinated with it. The Grammys, should I go there? No, I won't. The war in Ukraine. Have I just hit on about five or so things that people are fascinated by right now? I want to be fascinated with Jesus. Isn't it interesting? With all those things that I just listed, God is pouring out his spirit on a younger generation that says, this world can't help us. Only God can. Only God can. As the world is being shaken. We have been told in the word of God that the world will be shaken. But that which cannot be shaken shall remain. Now you can take that personally in your life first of all. Sometimes you feel like the Lord's shaking you. Because there's things in your life that you need to get right with God. It's no fun to be shaken by God in that respect. But he brings you to that place because he knows it's best for you. And then God shakes the church. I believe that we're living in those days. He said, judgment begins in the house of God. What shall it be for the world? As we approach the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, and God once again awakens as he's responding to the prayers of the church and his people across this land, and God is pouring out his Holy Spirit, as we're going to pray on Thursday. Wouldn't it be great Thursday? We get reports from the west coast to the east coast, from the north to the south, that co Christian college campuses are breaking out in revival. I remember my days at Bible college. Man, I'm feeling old. But I remember going to Bible college and standing in a chapel service, worshiping God just like we were worshiping God this morning. And I know that it wasn't the air conditioning. It was the winter. And I know that it wasn't anything else that was up, up above us. All I know is we were worshiping God. The Spirit of God was being poured out. And you know what it says on the, in the book of Acts? There was like a sound of a rushing mighty wind. I experienced that. I don't know if anybody else did, but I remember it clearly. And I felt this rushing wind hit my side of my face. I felt it. Like, where did that come from? I know where it came from. It came from the Holy Spirit of God. Man, I was fired up to do what I could for Jesus after that moment. But I had to get on my face and say, even in that chapel service, God, forgive me, cleanse me, change me, help me, Lord, to know that what I'm about to do with my life may cost me everything. There are times where there's physical manifestation of the presence of God. Would you agree with me? Some fall out in the spirit. They're slain in the spirit. Some, some quake or, or their hands shake in the spirit. There's all kinds of things. It's your body responding to the glory of God. 
We read some in the Old Testament, they fell as dead men and women before God because they came in contact with the glory of God. Isaiah came in contact with his presence in Isaiah chapter 6, and he fell before God, and he said, Woe is me, I live among a people of unclean lips. I have unclean lips. Take the coals from the altar and touch my lips. How many of you know that that's what needs to happen today? That's what needs to happen in my life, your life, the church. And Lord, do it in the lives of another generation. Because I can tell you something, in the spiritual warfare we're engaged in, the devil wants this generation. But God says, no, I'm raising up another generation. I've heard the prayers of people. I've heard the cries of people going up, saying, oh God, some of you said, save my kids. Save my kids, God. Do another awakening in my young people's lives, my kids' lives, my grandkids' lives. Do it, Lord, before you come. I mean, believe God hears those prayers. Make sure I'm not moving too much. God is getting the attention of people. Are you stirred this morning like myself? That we could hunger and thirst for more of him. Again, you can measure that. Are you, are you satisfied? Are you like, hey, this is great. This is all there is. I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing. I don't want to be there. Brides on wedding day getting ready for that march down the aisle and the bridegroom's on the platform, that morning, there's no sleeping in. There's getting up, probably not sleeping at all the night before. I didn't sleep hardly at all the night before, you know, to marry Jill. I'm like, you know, the, the anticipation that in just a few hours, I'm going to be married, husband and wife. I'm just talking from a marriage perspective because Jesus is called the bridegroom. We're called the bride. And as we near his coming, there's no sleeping in. There's no getting careless. There should be an excitement. There should be a sense of today's the day. How many of you know this? Today could be the day Jesus comes. There's nothing keeping him prophetically from coming today for the church. So we live our life in focus of eternity, not for the frivolous things of this world. Now, there are a lot of things that we like to do, and I'm not saying it's wrong to go on a vacation and, and you know, spend some time at the lake and, and these kind of things. There's nothing wrong in that. God gave us nature to enjoy, right? To refresh. Jesus got alone on the mountainside. I'd like to go on a mountainside myself right now. Colorado sounds kind of good. No, not right now, but, but I do know that that's what God is causing us to look at our appetites, hunger and thirst. Sounds like appetites to me, right? I like this. A gentleman by the name of R.T. Kendall, and he wrote a book on the Sermon of the Mount. I got it. It's pretty thick. It's about 400 pages. It's a lot of reading. But he goes through the Sermon on the Mount. And he gave an, a true illustration. He says, I recall an incident when I was eight or nine years old when I spent the night at my grandma's house. How many of you have ever spent the night at grandma's house? Some of you? He recounts it like this. So I'm I'm spe he's spending the night at grandma's house. He says, I dreaded a test I was going to have at school the next day. You see, I was not prepared. I woke with a feeling of sickness. His mother was there. He says, hey, mom, I am sick. I won't be able to go to school. Okay, honey, you just stay in bed. But as an eight and nine-year-old, he, he protested. He said, but I, 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 I want to eat breakfast first. You know, he's at grandma's house. How many know grandmas make good breakfast? Well, mom replied, if you have a good appetite, there, there isn't much wrong with you. I'll prepare breakfast while you get dressed for school. Hmm, appetites, desire. I've always said people will do what they want to do. People do crazy things. Have you ever done something crazy? No, you don't have to tell me now. I would love to hear some of it, shake my head and wonder. 
why some of you are still alive. <laughs> some of the crazy things that you've tried and done. That's the reason guys die earlier. We're just crazy. The wives sit back and say, what are you doing? That's somebody told me that one time. Hey, what is the hunger? What is the desire of your heart? I believe with all my heart that, yes, what we are seeing and, and experiencing today is an appetite. It is a hunger. By the way, when we had that great, mighty, wonderful service out at college, we never had lunch. We never had classes the rest of the day. Matter of fact, if I recall right, we didn't have classes most of the week. I remember going to class. We never opened the textbook. The professor was a Holy Spirit class. Hallelujah. I still remember her. She opened, she says, let's have prayer before we start class. We never started class. Because all we did is pray and the power of God came down in the classroom. You see, young people, I'm talking from my experience. But God wants to do it again. Church service doesn't always have to feel like it's a cookie cutter thing. Done by noon and out to lunch by 1230 doesn't have to be that way all the time. It might happen from time to time. We have structure and order, right? We have things we do, but we meet together knowing this morning that this could be the last time we're together before maybe one of us goes on to be with Jesus or Jesus comes. And where you're at with your hunger and thirst for Christ today is really where it matters. The psalmist said in Psalm 42, 1 through 2, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? Not, I hope sometime I can. He's so desiring. He says, when can I go and meet with God? Psalm 63, 1. O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. These are just two scriptures that come to my mind this morning. And thinking for my own life, where do I hunger and thirst for God this morning? How does it measure in my life? When we look at Matthew 5, 6 again, what Jesus is saying He's saying, you are blessed if you have an appetite for more of God and you can't live without him. You just can't. I couldn't do it without him. A desperation like someone who is naturally starving. How I many you know what it feels like to go without food for a while? You're like, man, I'm, I've heard people say, I'm starving. Let's eat. Have you ever felt that sense of desperation? having a desire to please and to honor Him with everything that is within you. The question this morning is this. What brings us to a place that we realize we must have more of His righteousness in our lives? What brings us to that place? God stirring us, getting our attention. Sometimes it's in a crisis moment. Right? Right? A crisis moment, all of a sudden, I need God really bad. A sickness. Financial issues and struggles. Someone's in an accident. Relationships breaking apart. Or maybe somebody's like a Jonah and you're running. God's got to really get your attention. Right? And then others. Could it be said of us that we're at that place where, Lord, I just want a deepening desire to spend more time in your presence. More than just a three or four minute prayer every day. But concentrated time of just praying and seeking God. Like yesterday when I pulled it after I went and ran an errand and had my car and I pulled in the driveway, I couldn't get out of my seat. Me and Jesus had to talk behind the steering wheel for a while. Have you ever had that happen to you? Lord, I can't even get out of this car right now. 
And then the Holy Spirit began to just drop things into my spirit. We got to have a hunger and a thirst for God right now, church. Replacing of the appetite of the world, its desires and passions for an ever-increasing righteousness of God. Because it's more than just experiences here and there. It is a growing thing of a growing internal work of the spirit of righteousness in your life. People don't like to hear that sometimes. They just want it quick and easy. I want this pop in, pop out experience with God and everything's okay. Like your six month checkup. That's not what this is. Let me tell you two things this morning. I come on as far as notes. Let me tell you, first of all, what this righteousness is not. It's talk, we talk about now, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. What, this, what is this not? First before, and then we'll tell you what it is. This righteousness he's talking about is not what I call saved righteousness. There's two of them that are pop up there on the same screen. It's not saved righteousness. Now, what do we mean by that? You are made righteous, right? Sins forgiven, cast away. You know the scripture, as far as the east is from the west, your sins are removed from you. You receive Christ in your life, you become what? The temple of the Holy Spirit of God. How I many you know, as a believer, you're the temple of the Spirit? There's a big word for this. It's called justifi justification or justified, right? I learned from my dad. He told me years ago when I was a kid, he says, justified means just as if you didn't sin. Your sins are washed away. You're made whole. Some call it a credited righteousness, a righteousness in a standing before God that you can come boldly before him to find help in your time of need. Your righteousness? No. The righteousness of Christ, clothed with it. I'm his child. How many of you are the child of God this morning? Wave at me. You're a child of the king. Hallelujah. You have a saved righteousness before God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is gone. I'm so thankful this morning for this new righteousness in Christ, a new life in him. But no, listen, there are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, so they shall be filled. We're not talking about a saved righteousness. You're already there. Is it a moral justice? How many would like to see moral justice in the world today? I would love to see more moral justice. Scripture that addresses this very need for moral justice and righteousness, if you will, can be found in Proverbs 14, 34. What is the scripture? Many of you already know it. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. What exalts a nation? Righteousness. Moral justice. We should all be praying for and seeking for, actively participating in seeking righteousness for our nation. Amen? For our community. To be a voice, a light on a hill, salt that seasons, that seasons who we see and the words that we speak. Yes, in our workplaces. How many you think there should be more righteousness in your workplace? You want to see that, right? And even in our families. You get your family reunion together and you're like, we need more righteousness here. <laughs> yeah. I'm passionate. Passionate about things that bother me. Racism, poverty, abortions, mistreatment of others, child trafficking. How many think the list could go on? These things bother me. I want moral justice. I want righteousness in our land. Lest we fall under the curse. I want to be a blessed nation, a blessed land, blessed community. There are different communities have more blessings than other communities. Did you know that? Because righteousness is being exalted in certain communities. In other places, it's downright bad to be there. You don't want to be there. So yes, but blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. It's not moral justice we're talking about. And number three, it's not an outward act, the outward acts of righteousness. We all should be living out our faith. Correct? Living it out. And we do that by what we call acts of righteousness. 
acts of righteousness. And those acts of righteousness are following close beside that whole subject of obedience to God's word for your life. But here it is, church. You've got a choice to make. You've got a choice to make. A choice about your Christian faith. What will you do with your Christian faith? What are you doing now with your Christian faith? And the disciplines of your life. Righteous disciplines. How many know there's some righteous disciplines? Well, I'm told to be a giver. Don't hold on to my money. I'm supposed to be a tither. Someone who gives my offering. Those are acts of righteousness. Obedience. I attend church. Do you? Yeah, you're here, so I don't have to ask you. <laughs> Yeah, I attend church. That's an act of righteousness. You make a decision. You make a decision to go visit the sick this week. That's an act of righteousness. To serve others and to serve the church is an act of righteousness. How about this? Jesus said to give a cup of cold water in my name. You do it as unto me. Think about your, these things. These acts of service. Outward acts of righteousness. But let me remind you of Titus chapter 3 and verse 5. And Titus was really good at his letter to talk about doing good works as the body of Christ. He said, he saved us, referring to Christ, not because of righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. I'm mean, thankful for the mercy of God. None of us would be saved. None of us would be ready to meet, meet God if it wasn't for his mercy. We're all undone. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Yeah. It's not all the righteous things that you do, and yet these are things that must be done as an outward sign of your faith. Because James chapter 2, verse 26 says, Faith without works is dead. Faith without works of righteousness is dead. But you cannot rely only on works of righteousness to make heaven your home. It's a heart matter. A humbling matter. A surrendering matter. So blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled is not referring to the outward acts of righteousness. Although we should be wanting to do that all the more. Lord, let me be your hands and let me be your feet. Let me be your voice. Let others see Jesus living in me. Are you with me? That should be what we want. But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. So let's switch gears to the second one. The second point. Let's talk about what this righteousness is that we are to hunger and to thirst for. What is it? First of all, it's a humbling righteousness. What do I mean by that? This righteousness that I seek is not about impressing others. Would you agree there's a lot of people who want to just impress other people? There's the... If you're humble... Before God, and I preached on humility. If you didn't hear it, you can go back and listen to it. I preached on humility. An absence of smugness, of haughtiness, of arrogance, of legalism. I mean, think the Pharisees were not, are not living out humble righteousness. They weren't. If you're seeking the righteousness of Christ, you're not looking over your shoulder to see if somebody's watching you. You know, those Pharisees, look at me worship. Look what I give. Look at all these things that I do. You know, and, or look at us as a church. Man, you know, see what we're doing. See how we're living. That's not what this is. Jesus is talking about a humbling righteousness. After all, the verse before it talks about being meek. Hello? Meek? Now we talk about Seeking righteousness? It doesn't matter if, if you're noticed by others or rewarded on this earth for your life of faith and sacrifice. In heaven, that which has been done in secret will shall be made known. Crowns will be given that you had no idea 
about what people had done on this earth. What is most important to your heavenly Father for you in your relationship is that your heavenly Father is watching you, regardless of anyone else. You walk into the doors of the church, it's not about who's here and who's not. I mean, yes, if someone's not here, you should reach out to them and find out why and pray for them. But it's not about a checklist and say, well, I'm, I'm a little bit better than so-and-so because, man, bless God, I'm in church every Sunday and I give and I do this and this and this. You're no different than the Pharisee. Humbling righteousness. I lay, and when I get to heaven and I've laid my treasures in heaven, all of those treasures that Jesus says lay up in heaven, I'm going to take and lay at the feet of my Jesus. Because I'm not going to be comparing one person's storehouse over another. We just want to be with Jesus. The one who died for us. The one who gave his very self so that we could enjoy eternal life with him. Sacrifice. A life of faith. A humbling. This is what we desire. And speaking of those mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11, when you have time, you can read Hebrews chapter 11 again. It's a wonderful faith chapter. And, and the writer of Hebrews lists all these faithful saints of old, both men and women, found in Hebrews 11, 38 to 40. Let me read that portion with, with you this morning. It said this. It says this. The world was not worthy of them. Who's them? Those that are all listed as the saints in Hebrews chapter 11. It says, the world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts. How many of you ever felt like you wandered in a desert or in a mountain? They were in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith. Yet none of them received what had been promised. And I love this. You may never have caught this before, but listen, the further we go. God had planned. How many know God's plans are much bigger than your plans? They went through all of that. But God had planned something better for us. Wait a minute. Aren't we talking about those saints? Why do we have this plural pronoun us? Why does he switch gears here and say God planned something better for us that only together with us would they be made perfect? I've got the answer, I think. Chapter 12. Do you not know that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses cheering us on to our heavenly reward? For these saints of old and for us today, we have something better to share together. Because it was God's plan all along. A home and a reward in heaven. Whether before the cross or after the cross, we become the us. That God has planned something better for us. Knowing this, I humbly come before God. Lord, I hunger for your righteousness. I thirst for your righteousness. David of old says, I hunger like a deer. I thirst like a deer with no water. I thirst for it, Lord. I hunger for it, just like they did who were in the mountains, the caves, the ground, the holes. They were, they were in down, buried down underneath. Listen, whether we're before or after, the same is true. For the righteous shall inherit the, the kingdom of heaven. Once again, righteousness. That you and I hunger and thirst for and, and talking about humble righteousness is the praise and approval only of your heavenly Father. For my children... They may want the approval of dad through their life. Boys, let me tell you. You want the approval of your heavenly father. Do you hear me? I'm your earthly father. And you might want to have the approval of dad. But what? And I'm just flesh and blood. I have my issues too. My family knows I got issues. How about you? <laughs> what you want is the approval of your heavenly Father. So we humbly 
and earnestly hunger and thirst for His righteousness. I don't expect for people to be clapping their hands for me. Although, you had that happen today. Thank you. But I wasn't expecting that. It's very sober to consider the words of Jesus in John chapter 15, verse 18, when he says this to those who are following after him. He says, if the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. You know what that tells me? If you hunger and thirst after his righteousness, not everybody's going to like you. Are you living for the approval of others? Are you living to be a people pleaser? Oh, I just, you know, I don't want them to be mad and angry at me. And I'll just kind of either keep my mouth shut, not say anything, or I'll just kind of go along with the crowd. Listen, it's time. This is a younger generation that's rising up saying, you know what? If we're hated by the world, so what? This world's got nothing to offer me. They're disappointed in the world. But you can never be disappointed in Jesus. He's the same yesterday, 50 years ago, when the revival of the college campuses came. He is the same God who's a revival. He wants to bring renewal and awakening to lives again today. And he wants to do it in your life. And I say to our young people, that same powerful presence I felt as a 21, 22, 23-year-old, God wants to do it for you too. To let you know that he's never going to leave you, that he is for you, he's not against you, that greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, and you're a more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ. Commit these verse, verses to memory, live them in your life, live for the approval of God, and hunger and thirst after righteousness, for you shall be filled. Finally, it's an internal righteousness. And I'm probably repeating some, but born in the heart. Born in the heart. Hearts that are tender. Hearts that are broken to be filled. What are we being filled with? We're being filled with more of His presence. Uh-oh. That sin's got to go. Right? Throw off that sin and that Thing that so easily besets you. Throw it off. Why? Because I'm hungering and thirsting for what? Righteousness. I will be filled with his presence. And nothing else matters. Is that what we need today? More of his presence. More of his glory. Oh my goodness. Like Moses, who'd been in the presence of God, now to his world, he was a reflection. We, with unveiled faces, reflect the glory of God. Wherever you're at, there's peace. You know what they say, they're saying about Asbury College, and when you go there, some are going, they says there is an indescribable sense of peace. Now, our views of revival in Pentecostal circles, you know, we like the flamboyant. <laughs> People are jumping and running and, and uh, you know, things are happening. It's all about what happens in the heart. I think what's amazing is what God is doing is not simply from what we would call a Pente Pentecostal perspective of awakening. But it is, it is flowing into denominational territory that we haven't witnessed. Young adults, you haven't witnessed it in your lifetime. And I'm witnessing it. You're witnessing it. It's what we've been praying for. It's what we've been believing for. A peace that passes all understanding. A hush. At the top of it, it says, holiness unto the Lord. A holy consecration in his presence, in his glory, leaving, showing forth the glory of God. In just a few minutes today, you're going to be leaving and the glorious presence of God because you're hungering and thirsting after who and what? Righteousness and him. You shall be filled and people will say, what's different with you? I want to be around you. Elijah, you'll go into the cafeteria like I did all those years ago and they'll be like, it's the best cafeteria in the week. Why? 
Because the righteousness of Jesus. And people are feeling it. Kids are feeling it. Kids, kids are knowing it. They walk through the doors on Wednesday night up here in the sanctuary or down in the youth group. Some of those kids are coming from some very chaotic situations. And they walk in and you know what they feel? The peace of God. They feel Jesus. That's the awakening we need. That's the stirring we need more of. An internal work of the Spirit. And with that comes His power. Wonder-working power. The power of God. The Spirit of power. Ye shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. I believe that God is stirring a generation that will experience once again the power of the Spirit of God. Not just in a sermon, not just in words, not just in someone's testimony, but personally experiencing it in their life. Confessing of sin and repentance of lifestyle must be a part of pursuing His righteousness. The renewal, the revival, the awakening, however you want to call it and whatever you've been praying for, and I've been praying for it here, is more than attending services somewhere else, although that's not a problem. But we need God's movement here. We need Him here. Thank God you can travel to places. I've traveled to places Experience some mighty moves of God, but you know what it did in my spirit? I can't get, wait to get home because I'm going to believe God for it right here at Carroll Assembly of God. I've gone to district councils. I've gotten filled up, and I'm like, I can't wait to get home to my church family because I'm going to dig in. Hallelujah. I'm going to get to the men's stuff. I'm going to get to the ladies' Bible study. I'm going to get to the Thursday morning Bible study. I'm going to help out on Wednesday night. I'm going to go visit the sick. It's the actions that accompany the experience. Otherwise, we just live from one experience to the other. No, it's a life change. It's something that says inside of me, Oh, to be like thee. Do you know the hymn? I'm dating myself. And we're wrapping this sermon up, but man, I'm preparing this sermon, and I, the songs I learned when I was a kid always come back to me. Oh, to be like thee, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Gladly I'll forfeit all of earth's treasures, Jesus, thy perfect likeness to wear. Oh, to be like thee, full of compassion, Loving, forgiving, tender, and kind. Helping the helpless. Cheering the fainting. Seeking the wandering sinner to find. Oh, to be like thee, lowly in spirit. Holy and harmless. Patient and brave. Meekly enduring cruel reproaches. Willing to suffer others to save. Oh, to be like thee, Lord. Lord, you are coming. Now to receive the anointing divine. All that I am and have I am bringing. Lord, from this moment, all shall be thine. Oh, to be like thee while I am pleading. Pour out thy spirit. Fill with thy love. Make me a temple. Meet for thy dwelling. Fit me for life and heaven above. Oh, to be like thee. Oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer, pure as thou art. Come in thy sweetness. Come in thy fullness. Stamp thine own image deep on my heart. Would you bow your heads with me this morning? Father, let that be the prayer of every heart here today. That you would stamp your very image upon us. Lord, that we as we hunger and thirst after you would say less of me and more of you. Lord, may you consume us in our pursuit. And even as we pursue you, draw us closer to you. 
for we want to become more like you. I come back as we're praying and our heads are bowed. I come back to the scripture again. To hunger and thirst for righteousness, you shall be filled. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I have a paraphrase I want to read to you from this verse. Deeply joyful, spiritually whole are those who actively seek right relationship with God. And in so doing, discover that He alone can completely save and satisfy your soul. I want to know this morning, their heads bowed and their eyes closed, and this message that God has birthed on my spirit is for all of us. Maybe you're here today, and there's an emptiness in your heart. There's an emptiness in your soul. Jesus wants to come in there and fill you. He wants to forgive you. He wants to cleanse you. He wants you to know that He loves you. He knows you by name. He wants to come and reside in your heart and life. He wants you to know that you don't have to live with the guilt and shame of past sin and mistakes. There's no condemnation in Jesus Christ. Your life can be made new. And today, if you're here, you're listening. And you know today that you need your heart and life right with God. You know today that you want to ask Jesus to save and forgive you, to make you new and to reside and come and be in your heart and life today. You need to make that decision and you say, Pastor Dave, remember me. I'm making that decision right now. Raise your hand up real quick and put it down. Say, I'm making that decision. I'm making that decision today. Hallelujah, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I mean, today would say, Pastor Dave, I want to join you with this. I want to hunger and thirst more for the righteousness of God in my life. I want that more than anything else. Raise your hands. Maybe raise both if you have to. Lord, that's me. Lord, I want everyone to stand this morning. And how we're going to close the service this morning, as we've been doing of late, is we're going to make a stand for this. We're going to make a move for this. And I'm going to ask you if you'd come and join me. Because I'm going to stand up here and I'm asking God to do that in my life. I'd like to pray with you if you want to be prayed for as well. But as we begin to sing, draw me close. How many of you want that? Come on up right now. If you raised your hand, come and join me right now. And we're going to come and we're going to step forward here. Hallelujah. What I want you to do right now is lay your hands on some that are around about you. And I want you to begin to raise your voice. And I want you to begin to pray for them if you're comfortable with that. Maybe some are like, I'm a little quiet, that's okay. But I want you to lay your hands on people, around your brothers and sisters. And I want you to begin to pray for them right now. Come on, church. Let's pray for one another. Oh, God, we pray for one another. Lord, we believe you right now. Oh, God, Lord, that you're doing a work and a miracle in lives today. That, God, you are, we are desiring you. Lord, that we are thirsting for you that, Lord, you will fill us. Lord, I pray for a filling of the Holy Ghost and your righteousness upon every heart and life today. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Father, I just pray. I just pray, oh God. I pray right now in Jesus' name that, Lord, that this is the hour. Lord, the, the prophetic that you have spoken over our church. The prophetic that you have spoken over our church shall come to pass. Lord, I believe it. I believe it even now that, Lord, you're raising up a generation. Hallelujah. Empower them with the Spirit of God. Empower us, Lord. Help us, God, to pour into the lives of others. In Jesus' name, Lord, give us a greater opportunity to share our faith to witness of what God is doing in our life and in your church. Oh God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Lord, may you be everything to us. Everything to us. Oh God, keep our eyes turned towards you. Lord, help our eyes, our focus to always be on you. Lord, I pray today and I will continue to pray 
that every time we get together, that every time we meet, that the presence of God, that the thirst and hunger for you would be present. Lord, I ask this in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.